The story begins as a group of kids dream about becoming treasure hunters with the goal of obtaining riches and glory. Everyone is in total agreement, including the kids that's just like a cardboard box, and they vow to become the best heroes in the world. Treasure hunters travel the world to explore ruins called treasure vaults so they can collect the relics hidden inside. They risk their lives fighting monsters called phantoms, but in return they can obtain vast riches and glory. A very highly regarded clan is holding interviews for potential new numbers and our protagonist named Cry Andre waits in line. There is a limit to how far a solo hunter can go, so it's vital to join a party if they have their sights on a high goal. Some girl named Rita introduces herself to Cry because she's the only one around that doesn't look like a creep, but Cry awkwardly doesn't shake her hand. Ruta wants to join a party because she has been having a hard time with a certain treasure vault, but some guy mocks her for trying to do so while only being level 3. Ruta is insulted when he calls her an amateur, but the guy points out that she's too low of a level to join the renowned First Steps clan. He recommends that she just runs to her mommy so Ruta challenges him to a fight, the argument is broken up and Cry is glad that the commotion is over. Inside, Ruta's overwhelmed by all the hunters that are trying to join the First Steps clan, and she is shocked to hear that this is Cry's fifth time being at one of these interviews. Skill is everything for hunters, those with talent can instantly make a name for themselves and climb the ranks. Those without talent, however, can only cling to the few chances they get. The First Steps plan consists of several parties, and the Arc Brave parties is the strongest at this interview. They even managed to complete a level 7 treasure vault with just 6 of their members, their leaders Ark Rodan, and if he accepts a hunter then they are guaranteed to be successful. However, as far as Cry knows, the Ark Brave has never accepted a new member through one of these interviews. Their table is surrounded by a ton of interviewees, but Ruta wonders why another party only has one single empty chair. Just then the big guy named Greg comes out of nowhere and explains that that table belongs to the party that originally founded First Step. They are called the Grievers and they came to the capital years ago. With their overabundant talent, they made a name for themselves as one of the top parties in the capital. Their full name is the Grieving Souls and they're actually the party of Cry's childhood friends. This is the first time that the Grievers are accepting new members and it's the entire reason so many people came out to the event. There is no one at the table though, so it seems like this might have just been a false rumor. One red-headed kid makes his presence known by saying that he has no time for losers and he demands to know where the grievers are. He boasts about already being level 4, and he was planning to allow the capital's strongest party to recruit him. Some girl named Tino was stopped from showing this kid his place, but Tino plans to make it quick, just like her sister would do. She wants to teach him a lesson because she deserves to be in grieving souls before this kid, but she is reminded that the clan master told her not to make a scene. It's too late, as everyone antagonizes them and they make room for a fight. Tino is eager to get going but Cry is worried about something, and he tells Rita to come outside with him. The redhead wants to do some trash talking, but Tino plans to hear what he has to say after he chops his head off, because again that's what her sister would do. As Cry makes his escape, he thinks about how he never should have come today. As anticipation for the fight reaches its peak, Tino's sense of something shocking enough to draw her attention away. She completely ignores the feverish chanting for the battle and pays no attention to the redhead powering up his sword, instead her focus is now completely on Cry. Tino shocks everyone by rushing to Cry, but what's even more strange is that she calls him Master, it turns out the Cry are actually the First Steps clan master and leader of Greeting Souls, the clan was waiting for him to get started and everyone is shocked to realize who he is. In this golden age of treasure hunters, one man stood amongst all of them and his name is Cry. Several years before all this, Cry and his friends arrived at the capital. They were new, but they were finishing treasure vaults suited for beginners and record speeds. One time Cry was saved by his friend, but his friend just assumed that he was just acting as bait. Cry and his friends all shared the same dream of becoming great hunters, but the amount of talent ahead was not equal. His five friends possessed monstrous potential so Cry considered himself to be exceedingly ordinary compared to them. That was when Cry decided that he would only get in their way if he stayed with them. They were all really close friends, so they never said anything so Cry knew that he would have to make the decision to leave himself. Cry told them all goodbye one day, but they shockingly decided to make him their leader instead. They were all in total agreement so Cry wondered if they even listened to what he just said. The decision was already made for him so Cry has spent the last four years as the leader of a party of his gifted childhood friends, the entire time wishing that he could just retire from being a hunter altogether. Back to the present, Ruta can't believe that she was talking to the clan master of First Steps. Cry was super late to the interview because he overslept, but Ark Thing said it was just a joke. 
Tino tells Ark to get away from him because she hates how superficial he is, but Ark just thinks she's joking too. He credits Cry for diligently scouting the crowd, but he's way off. Ark's impressed that Cry went undercover without his uniform, but again, Cry points out that he really did just oversleep. Tino has had enough of Ark, so she wants him to be removed from the clan altogether, but this guy is a leader of Ark Brave. Tino is a solo hunter affiliated with First Steps, and she's an apprentice to Carrie's childhood friend named Liz. Cry says that there's no room for new members in the Greeting Souls, but he gets an idea and he wonders if Ark Brave would take in a new member if he recommended them. Ark trusts Cry with all his heart so he says that he would, they shocks everyone in the room because Ark Brave rarely ever accepts anyone, but Ark says that one person wouldn't hurt. Cry is glad that Ark is such a generous guy, but one of their members is furious about having someone forced onto their team. Tino assumes that she's the one he will be recommending so she is really grateful. She is distracted when the mullet head from earlier wants his revenge, but Cry says to leave him be. The kid introduces himself as Gilbert Bush and Cry is surprised to hear that he isn't in a party even though he's level 4. Cry can tell that this kid won't be an asset immediately, but he will become something special once he gets training from Ark and the others. Cry however is really bad at judging people, so whoever he picks to join Ark will be totally based on luck. Cry then shocks everyone when he chooses to recommend Gilbert but only on one condition, he explains that the most important thing for Hunter is to not lose because being weak only puts their party in danger. Because of this, he needs Gilbert to show that he's not going to lose. Cry gives Gilbert a fair warning though, because he has never lost a single time since becoming a hunter. Everyone is amazed by Cry's confidence, but Cry knows that this fact is only true because he has actually never been in a proper fight before. Cry doesn't plan to fight directly this time either, he makes things way more interesting by telling everyone that whoever ends up with this ring will be the one he recommends to join Ark Brave. Cry starts off the madness by giving the ring to Gilbert so Tino instantly kicks the mullet head right in his face. The ring is dislodged from his hands and everyone wonders if he's even alive anymore. Everyone goes crazy as they go after the ring and Cry tells them that it's actually a relic that they can keep if they get it. As the chaos intensifies, Cry says goodbye to the two he met earlier and decides to head home. The next day, Cry is told that he made the front page news, he made a huge fight break out and it ended up with the entire venue getting blown up. The vice clan master is Eva Renfield and Cry tells her to use Ark Brave funds to pay for the repairs. Eva thinks that Cry depends on Ark way too much, but Cry doesn't think much of it. Ark is a really laid-back guy so Cry wants him to speak with the Angry Explorers Association for him as well. The Explorers Association wants to speak with Cry directly but Cry doesn't want to go outside without an escort. To make things worse, his disguised relic was broken as well. His disguised relic is called Irreversible Face and it allows its user to have any face they want. Eva assures him that no one will attack him during the day so Cry decides to just go. At the Explorers Association, Cry begs for mercy and apologizes for causing so much commotion. The association branch managers named Gark Welter and he tries to come Cry down. Cry frantically continues to defending himself and points out that no civilians were hurt. Gark's assistants wishes that Gark wouldn't scold Cry so hardly but Gark points out that he hasn't even said anything yet. Gark explains that no one has formally complained about the incident, clans like First Step so need to set an example for the other hunters, he can't just let Cry go unpunished. The Explorers Association gets tons of jobs and some of them hardly pay any money. The other problem they have is that some jobs are so incredibly difficult that nobody will do them, the hunters call these types of jobs chores. Gark plans to punish Cry with one of these chores, and he gets up sad when Cry seems like he's going to reject it. Cry clears things up by accepting the punishment, but he points out that what he did this time wasn't actually that bad. Cry looks through the book of chore and he plans to pick an easy one that he would just pass on to Ark anyway. Cry finds the perfect level 3 chore and he calls it corpse retrieval duty. The girl points out that it's actually a rescue mission and she wishes that he wouldn't joke about the hunters not surviving. After he leaves Gark is impressed with Cry for actually choosing the most dangerous mission. When he returns to his clan house Cry is shocked to hear that everyone else in the clan is out doing something. Tino reveals that she ended up with his ring because she didn't want anyone else to touch it and she is glad to hear that she can really keep it. She is surprised when Cry asks she is free right now and she eagerly says that she has never been more free in her life. Tino is clearly expecting for him to ask her out on a date but Cry just wants her to do the chore. Tino runs away as fast as she can, but Cry uses his hounding cane to capture her. Tino has never been more disappointed as she just wanted to go have some ice cream with Cry, instead he just pushed the terrible chore onto her. 
What's worse is that she's just a level 4 and she can't rescue 5 people on her own. Tino knows that he sends his subordinates on missions where they nearly meet their demise to make them stronger, but she begs Cry not to get carried away with this kind of Spartan training. Cry agrees that she shouldn't go alone. Tino assumes that this means he will be going with her, but she is disappointed to find that he just teamed her up with the hunters he met earlier. The story continues, we see six years ago, when Cry's party first arrived at the capital, they were about to walk into the association to officially register as hunters, but Cry started having second thoughts as soon as they got to the door. Luke told him to stop worrying about it so much since he was the one who suggested that they should aim to become the best in the capital, but Cry isn't worried about his friend's strength, he's worried because he knows he will only drive them down. Luke told him to stop saying such silly things and took it upon himself to open the doors of the association and declare that he is the strongest swordsman in the world, followed by Liz, who declared that she was the strongest thief in the world, there's no turning back after such a grandiose entrance so Cry walks up to the reception desk to register his party, but he wants to make them regret selecting him as their leader so when he's asked to pick a name for his party, he decides to pick something edgy and calls the party greeting soul for no reason. The others in the party felt the name was too dark and gloomy, but when Cry tries to use his bad naming sense as an excuse to quit being the leader, they all changed her tune and say they love the name. Back to the present Cry calls a meeting with all the people he wants to offload his work onto and Greg still can't believe Cry is really the guild master of the Grievers. As hard as it may be to believe Cry confirms his position, meaning he is also the infamous thousand tricks that everyone has heard about. In the association, when a hunter achieves a certain level of accomplishment and prestige, they are given special names and basically become celebrities. Cry ended up being with Thousand Tricks as his second name, but Gilbert refuses to believe that Cry is telling the truth because Thousand Tricks is meant to be the strongest person in the capital, and Cry looks like he never even trains. Tino immediately begins defending Cry and says Gilbert is the one who is too weak to comprehend Cry's power. Although Cry has no idea what power she's talking about because he is only called the strongest thanks to his friends constantly giving him undue praise. That aside, Cry asks if Gilbert and the others want to accept the job, but Gilbert refuses to accept a request from Cry because he still doesn't believe that Cry is the strongest in the city. Greg tries to stop Gilbert from talking because who knows what could happen if the strongest person in the capital gets angry, but Gilbert doesn't care and shoves his fingers up Greg's nose. Since Gilbert seems like he doesn't want to take part Cry simply gives up on trying to convince him and moves on to Greg, Greg is more than happy to accept Cry's request, so the only one left is Ruta. Since the quest is going to be in the wolf den, Cry thought this would be perfect for her since she was already trying to clear it. Ruta isn't exactly thrilled with her teammate's selection, but she says she will go along with it. Cry pleased to hear that so he tells Tino that if she needs more help she can ask someone else from the clan to go with her. Tino pleads with Cry to join the team as well, but he immediately refuses now that he has settled the matter of Tino's party Cry turns around to leave, but Gilbert doesn't like the fact that Cry is ignoring him, so he decides to challenge Cry to a duel, and if he loses he will join the team. Cry hates it when people challenge him so he comes up with a simple solution and agrees to the duel, but under the condition that Tino will fight in his place. Tino was fine with the arrangement because she is pissed at Gilbert for daring to insult and question her master, but she also uses the opportunity to show Cry just how flexible she can be with superb camera angles. Gilbert may have gotten his face caved in by Tino yesterday, but he says he was just caught off guard and that he won't be losing to her second time, and once he has beaten Tino he will come for Craig next. Cry's starting to get annoyed and has no intention of fighting for any reason today, but since Gilbert seems so confident Cry informs him that Tino is level 4 just like him, Tino adds to this by saying there's no way she could ever lose to someone like him and to assert her dominance, she drops her weapons on the ground. Ruta and Greg are starting to get worried because even if Tino is stronger fighting without weapons would put her at a serious disadvantage. Under normal circumstances, Tino would win this fight because even though both of them are on the same level, Tito even all her levels on solo missions, and she has a lot of experience fighting humans, so she should be able to win even without her weapon, but Gilbert possessed the Purgatorial Flame Sword, and that is enough of a wild card to tip the scales in his favor if he uses it right, or it would have been if he hadn't thrown his sword down and decided to fight barehanded as well. That was without a doubt a dumb move, but Gilbert refuses to be looked down on, so the wants to fight on equal terms as Tino, Tino now knows for sure that she can win so she says she wants to go get ice cream with Cry after she has beaten Gilbert up. As the match starts, she charges in and strikes at Gilbert's face. 
He manages to dodge the first strike, but he still gets hit with a kick to the face that sends him flying just like last time. It looks like the fight is already over, but to his credit, Gilbert gets back up and charges back in to continue fighting. He doesn't do much and gets caught and chokehold immediately, but at least he's got spirit. That he had to strain himself to do so Gilbert is eventually able to break free from Tino's hold. However, he immediately gets Max the ground I had chopped to the back of the head. He's definitely not getting back up this time so Tino begins celebrating and thanks Cry for helping her become so strong, although little Cry and never actually did anything to train her. Greg and Ruta are left in utter disbelief at the fact that Tino is so strong and Gilbert can't face the reality that there's someone stronger than him. Ever since the day he first picked up a sword, Gilbert knew that he was destined to become a hunter. As he trained he found himself surpassing the skill levels of professional swordsmen with ease, and when he finally became old enough to register as a hunter, he came to the capital and formed a small party to begin clearing vaults. Up till now he had never tasted defeat but even though she doesn't like him, Tino can appreciate that Gilbert is a strong swordsman, so she encourages him to pick up his sword if he wants to keep fighting. Gilbert refuses because of his pride and Tino is disappointed because foolish pride like that will only end up getting he killed. As much as Gilbert hates to admit Tino is right and if this had been a real fight, he would have been killed several times over by now. He has to face the reality that he isn't as strong as he thought he was, but just then, Cry calls over to him and guesses that Gilbert must have quit his former party because of a difference in strength. Gilbert is shocked because Cry totally right and Cry explains that a similar issue arose in his party, although he didn't leave because of it even if he may have wanted to. Gilbert misunderstands this to mean that Cry greatly outclasses all his teammates and greeting Soul, the strongest party in the capital and that gives him a whole new perspective on what it means to be the strongest. Cry then notices Gilbert's sword and gives it a light tap to see what he can do. Flames begin pouring out of it at Cray's command and Gilbert is astonished because in all the time he has possessed the sword, he has never managed to draw Flame's largest cry, much less control it to this extent, and Cry didn't even have to grab the sword by the handle to do it. In this world mana material is a core substance, and while it is everywhere can't be seen with the naked eye. However, within Treasure Vault's mana material is condensed into all sorts of physical forms, although there is still a lot about it that isn't understood. The White Wolf's Den is one of these treasure vaults and it is said that Wolf Phantom soaked in blood spawn within it, so Cry is glad he sent the others and didn't have to go down there himself. Eva asked him if he's sure it was a good idea to send inexperienced hunters into the Wolf's Den, but he believes they should be fine since the den is only level 3 and the four of them are pretty skilled. Also, he wants to thank Eva for the information she gave him on Gilbert because it was really funny to see his reaction when Cry randomly guessed a bunch of stuff about his past. She's glad she could be of service, but she also heard about the way Cry used Gilbert's relics so effortlessly and she wants to know how he did it. Cry explains that the relic was a straightforward one that kind Cry is able to control immediately, even Gilbert is an experience as he was able to use it without much training, so Cry doesn't think what he did was all that impressive. Still, there's nothing Cry loves more than collecting relics and is seriously considering asking Gilbert to sell him the sword, but Eva immediately shuts that down because Cry keeps spending a ton of his budget on relic collecting, his collection is already massive so she doesn't understand why he would even want another one in the first place. Cry explains that each relic is unique in its own way so even if he has over 20 relic rings alone he could always use more. Eve realizes she isn't getting through to him, but even if he does have a considerable income she can have him blowing it all on relics. All the profits of the Greeting Soul Party are split evenly among members regardless of contributions, so despite the fact that Cry barely ever does anything, he still gets a fat paycheck at the end of the month. Cry doesn't want to give up his relic collecting though, so when he notices that one of his relics needs to be charged he uses it as an excuse to leave the conversation. He goes to a member of the association and asks for a little help charging his relic up with magic and they're happy to help since Cry is always doing so much for them. While Cry's relic is being charged, the guy tells Cry about a rogue phantom that appeared on the road up north and destroyed a caravan. There were three level 3 hunters guarding the caravans to the phantom must be a strong one and the third order knights are now recruiting for an extermination party. The reports say the phantom was a wolf and the location isn't far from the white wolf den so it must have come from there, there was probably a mass spawning of wolves, so that must mean that Dan is absolutely crawling with enemies as they speak and anyone unlucky enough to be down there is going to have it at time. Cry tries to dissuade his worries and thinks to himself that Tino's party is probably fine, but then the people he is sitting with start talking about how the monsters and the white wolf den have been growing a lot stronger recently, so the association has been thinking of raising the threat level on it. In fact, 
a level 5 Lancer's party ended up going missing in that vault so there's no way anyone less than level 5 could handle it. Cry is definitely worried now and decides to take a look at the quest he received earlier, only now realizing that he was supposed to rescue said level 5 Lancer and his party. He really should have read the details of the quest before sending Tino and the others down there, but it's too late to call them back now. The others at the table see Cry acting strange, so they ask him if something is wrong and he tells them he actually sent Tino down into the White Wolf Den. The two are horrified that Cry sent Tino, who is only level 4 down into a vault at a level 5 party couldn't beat, he assumed must have known how dangerous it was and sent her down there as part of her training because what kind of irresponsible teacher would send his stupid on a deadly mission like this without researching it first. Cry suddenly gets up and says there's something urgent he needs to attend to. Once he gets into the halls, he starts having a panic attack and tries to rationalize it, saying Tino is quite skilled so she may be able to handle this and Gilbert is almost equal in strength to her as long as he is using his flame sword. However, Cry remembers that he used up all the power in the sword back when he was doing his demonstration, so if Gilbert didn't recharge it afterwards that sword is basically useless. While Tino and the others are approaching the White Wolf Den, they begin to sense a dangerous aura even though they haven't gotten to the den yet. Tino was expecting something like this to happen since Cry was the one who sent her out on this mission, which is why she wrote a will in case she ends up dying. Although she is sure that she won't die because this has all been perfectly calculated by Cry, she believes the fact that Cry chose them to join her on this mission must have also been carefully deliberated, but Greg doesn't think that's possible since Cry only met them yesterday. Gilbert agrees that it's improbable but he wouldn't put it past Cry to be able to do research on all of them before they had even met. In fact, the whole incident at the pub was probably part of his plan as well, so while this mission may be way above the league Tino is sure Cry wouldn't randomly send them on a mission they have no hope of surviving. Unfortunately, that's exactly what Cry did and he's freaking out over it, he decides to go and rescue them himself, so he goes into his hidden room and starts grabbing all the relics he can carry. As he is leaving Eva spots him and she too assumes Cry intentionally sent Tino on that dangerous mission just to test her, and while he obliviously planned it so she wouldn't be in danger of dying, he must still be slightly worried so he's going to check up on them. She even notices that Cry is carrying Shitori's slime relic, which is technically against imperial law to possess, but he doesn't know what he's going to be facing, so he wants to be prepared. He hands out onto the balcony and equips a wingsuit relic, so he can get the white wolf down as quickly as possible, and as he leaves Eva hopes he can make it back alright because the last person who used that wingsuit died after crashing headfirst to a wall. The story continues, we see years ago during the early days of the Greeting Souls party, it had only been a week since the clan began operating in the capital of Zabridia, and Redhead was already fuming because his ultimate divine sword, which he had named Blade of the Testament, had shattered like it was nothing more than a twig. Other envious members joked that fighting ghosts with a stick would be tough, while one of Girl's member remarked that she hadn't expected to find a cyclops in a level 1 vault since those monsters were level 4. Listening in on the conversation, a drunken adventurer approached the group calling the kids rookies, insisting that a cyclops would Rita complains that this kind of monster should never show up in a level 3 vault. Similarly, Greg doesn't understand why the Blade of Purgatory hadn't ignited during the battle, to which Gilbert explains that the sword is out of mana and he can't recharge it on his own. Ruta begins to think it might be better to retreat for now, and Greg adds that the situation is indeed different from what they were told. Especially, since under these circumstances the group they came to rescue is probably already dead. After hearing everyone's input, the leader Tino decrees that the plan will not be changed, anxious Greg asks whether survival isn't the top priority, but Tino firmly responds that they didn't come all this way to collect monsters those they came to rescue are still alive. In fact, they're executing a perfect level 8 strategies and the decision to deplete the Blade of Purgatory's mana was certainly part of the Master's plan. The group presses on toward the White Wolf's den, where humanoid wolves were armed with bows and firearms. This makes Greg realize that the ones they had defeated earlier weren't just randomly strong, but that the entire pack was highly skilled. Tino explains that this den was created to house the Silver Moon Wolves, who originally lived there. Meanwhile, Cry silently prays that at least Tino survives even if the rest of the group ends up being used as shields. Back with the team, Tino acknowledges that the enemy is far superior in terms of skill but they have one key advantage, teamwork no matter how strong the opponent they don't understand the concept of cooperation. With that said, more armed werewolves appear, and the group instinctively knows how to respond. Tino observes that even though they are an improvised team the setup isn't bad. Gilbert Bush might talk too much, but he's very competent. 
Greg Zangief with his wealth of experience works well with others. Ruta might not do anything flashy, but as a rogue she excels at locating enemies and without her, Tino wouldn't be able to focus on the fight. With every aspect of the strategy falling into place, Tino starts to believe that her master is a true genius for being so spot on. Meanwhile, in the heat of battle, Gilbert grows angry feeling as if he's being underestimated by the enemy. This feeling sends him back to an old memory one, where he thought he was going through the same thing when he ordered his subordinates to be more tenacious, but his team couldn't keep up with him so Gilbert gave up and left the group on the spot. Maybe they had been trying their best, but over time the gap between them only widened, so they should be able to handle the boss. Even so, Greg remains uneasy but Tino comments that he's way too cautious for someone who looks so tough and that safe missions never help anyone grow. Caution is good, but sometimes you have to be bold. Greg admits that she's not entirely wrong after all, once a hunter reaches level 4 they can make a living just by completing vaults below their level, every time he thought he couldn't win Greg would stop confronting his enemy, which was a direct result of watching many of his friends die. Tino responds that although Greg has been a hunter for a long time, he came to the first step precisely to change that mindset, and that's also why the master put him in the group. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense for Cry to have chosen someone he barely knows. Actually, Cry wanted to save everyone there meaning the master is like a god, and there's no way he assembled that team randomly, he looks like she's about to complain, but before she can, the leader cuts off the small talk and calls the group to continue their journey. Speaking of the cold and calculating God Cry begins to panic as he has no idea where the group he sent is. To make matters worse, the relic he's using to fly is basically an airplane without brakes which is obviously dangerous. However, despite all the bumps along the way, he manages to crash into the white wolf's den completely by accident. Meanwhile, Tino and the others face the dungeon boss, a giant white wolf. The moment the enemy makes its first move, the entire group pulls back clearly anxious, because there's no denying that this wolf is incredibly powerful. The team becomes hesitant, disorganized, torn between fighting and fleeing. Tino observes that the boss isn't wearing a helmet, which must be its weak spot. This is probably one of the thousand challenges set by her master cry so she must ensure she passes the test. With that in mind, she orders Gilbert to block one of the wolf strikes while she takes care of the rest. Gilbert steps up, bracing his sword against the overwhelming force of the climbing up the wolf's axe handle and making her way to its head. During the leap to deliver the final blow, she suffers a deep scratch but manages to stick to her plan and drive her sword into the creature defeating it once and for all. After their victory, Tino realizes her wounds quite serious but she has a healing potion ready, which eases the situation. Greg laments his broken sword, but Gilbert points out that he should be thankful it wasn't his head instead. Eventually, the big guy thanks Ruta for saving him, and they remember there's still a rescue mission head. Tino hands over her sword to Greg since he's now unarmed, but at that moment a giant spear is hurled at the leader barely missing her chest. As they gather their berry and Gilbert sacrifice themselves for the group, but the leader insists that no one should be sacrificed, commanding each member to aim for the wolf's eyes and organizing the team for a new offensive. The attack formation quickly falls into place, with Gilbert taking the lead ready to face death head-on, with his sword he blocks one of the wolf's attacks, followed by Greg striking but both are thrown back. Ruta hurls shurikens at another wolf's size, but the creature shuts them just in time. Tino then prepares a technique she developed under Cry's training, using an accessory that emits a bright flash to blind one of the wolves, seizing the opportunity Gilbert attacks, but even blinded, the wolf manages to hurl him against the wall with force. Tino chastises herself for a poor strategy that put a team member in danger and now it seems like everything is about to end, the team is surrounded with no resources left to fight. At that moment, Cry accidentally crashes into the scene, taking out a wolf with his wild flight. The remaining wolves hesitate to attack after witnessing such power but one advances with its sword. Cry using one of his accessories blocks the blow and fires projectiles with another bringing the creature down. With 17 security rings at his disposal, Cry can do quite a lot in battle but he just wants to go home, not even caring about finding the people he was supposed to rescue. To quickly end the situation he tosses his pendant into the air and detonates it with one of his rings creating a distraction for the group to escape. Soon everyone is retreating, although Tino is wounded and slower than the others. Gilbert complains about the pace, but Ruta points out that the group's leader is setting the pace for the injured rogue. In reality, though, Cry is running as fast as he can which happens to be as slow as the injured girl. Thinking the master is being considerate, Tino remembers that his kindness has always been one of his defining traits. 
A long time ago, when she was still a child she was in trouble with two guys until the grieving souls showed up to save her, ever since then she's wanted to be like them. After putting some distance between themselves and the wolves, the group takes a break and Cry uses another relic to heal Tino's wounds. Gilbert remarks somewhat disdainfully that the guy this is an item for everything but Cry doesn't care. They continue on their way under Cry Andre's leadership, though he has absolutely no idea what he's doing much less how to get out of this situation. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching. Want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.